Hey, Leslie, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. I want to ask, when you got a young guy like, like Greg Rousseau, who even in a year or two is still kind of learning, taking it all in, how important is it for a, a confidence of a guy like that that you're able to find situations where he can succeed in spots where you say, you know, when we do this, you're going to win. When we do this, you're going to be our guy. How big is that for a, a young guy's confidence? Well, in, in Greg's case, uh, when you put together a plan and, Eric Washington and Marcus West, uh, Eric being our lead D-line coach and Marcus being the assistant, when they put together a rush plan, I think all of us have a high level of confidence that it's going to be executed when it comes to Greg uh, because of his athleticism, how smart he is, and his ability to be able to take what we put together in the classroom to the grass and then being able to execute it, and it's vice versa. I think he has a lot of confidence in the coaches as well, and uh, he's off to a great start. Is it, you know – when you're trying to find those spots, I think you get a, a guy like Greg comes into the first round pick and there's expectations. You're supposed to this, you're supposed to do that. And sometimes it might take a little while to figure out what your role is. Maybe you, and, and sometimes it is what you're expected to do. And sometimes it's not. As a coach, you guys have been so successful at plugging younger guys in, no matter where they come in draft wise, figuring out, making them understand, you know, what they do or, or what they can do well early in their career in terms of building them up for a longer career. How important is that from your point of view as a coach? Well, it's extremely important. You know, in Greg's case, it was a little bit unique because of the fact that his final year, I mean, there was limited tape coming out of college. He had the really outstanding season. I think he had maybe 15 sacks. And, and then there was a period where he didn't play. So when we, we drafted him and brought him to rookie minicamp, a lot of it was projection. You're trying to project where he's going to be. And fortunate for us, it's really worked out. Uh, but we have taken great pride and developing our players, and that speaks to our assistant coaches, really putting the time in in the classroom and then having the drills in place to help young players develop and come along. Because in today's NFL, with free agency being the way it is, you end up playing with a lot of young players. So you better know how to develop players. Unfortunately, we have coaches that can do that. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. Coach Frazier, Mookie Hawkins, Waffle Sports 1080. How you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good, man, and uh, you guys do a one hell of a job of developing. Guys like Demar Hamlin could, you know, go out there and make their first start for you. So, just care to talk about how you think Demar fared in his first uh, start out there? You know, I, I really felt like he did a good job. Look, it, it was times in that atmosphere where it can be challenging. I mean, that's a tough uh, road venue to, to go into and to come away with a win, and uh, that, those fans are terrific there. Uh, they make it hard on a young guy. And that offense with Lamar Jackson, man, he's a special dude. So to come in and get a chance to start alongside Jordan Poirier, uh, which is a big deal, uh, I thought DeMar really held his own and made a lot of good plays for us. Coach, we're talking about a Baltimore Ravens offense that's, you know, I mean, hey, Lamar Jackson is, you know, one of the elite quarterbacks, an MVP candidate. He had a lot of window dressing and then a lot of very, a lot of different looks. But you just shut that team out in that second half. How, how proud are you of the way your defense went out there and played that second half, Coach? Oh, extremely proud of our guys, man. The way that they showed that mental toughness that you have to have in this league, looking to be able to go on the road and just battle, fight, uh, not let the circumstances, the adversity that, that happened early on, let that affect what they were trying to get accomplished overall. So extremely proud of the way they came out and just kept fighting and battling and being so resilient throughout that ball game. And uh, Coach, appreciate your time. Good luck this week. Thank you. Hey, hey Coach Alex Brasky with the Batavia Daily News. How about Kair Elam's confidence, maybe dealing with a little bit of disappointment, not starting in week one, but he certainly had a fantastic season. How about his confidence dealing with that and, and, and how he's put that uh, into production on the field? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of guys would have been discouraged uh, to have an injury at the corner position in Tre Davis's uh, place and to not maybe get that first start. Uh, but to his credit, he handled it the right way. And that was by, you know, being on top of it in the classroom, uh, preparing to go out and perform when he got his opportunity. And he's done that. He's done an extremely uh, a good job for us on defense. Uh, there have been some challenges as a rookie for sure, but that was probably the biggest challenge to have to face the fact that I'm not getting that first start and being able to handle that and not, not allowing it to affect his confidence 
which could preclude a poor performance. Uh, that hasn't been the case. He's been able to keep his confidence, and he's helped us uh, in these, these last few get ball games. Kind of on that same note with Dane Jackson, when you suffer that type of injury, maybe some tentativeness your first time back on, on a game field. Did you see any of that from him and just your overall impressions of, of his performance his first time back since, since that ugly injury? Well, you know, uh, you're right. When I saw that, that injury uh, uh, that hit in the game, when I watched the tape, I was like, wow. And so to see him come back yesterday after missing a ball game and just being fearless out there in his tackling, I mean, there were no signs that he was afraid or uh, wasn't going to tackle. Uh, he was there early on making tackles on their running backs, uh, on their tight ends. Uh, just did it. I mean, Dane, in a lot of ways, is a warrior and is an effort and the way he approaches the game. And he played very, very well for us in his first game back. He did a good job. Thanks, Coach. You're welcome. Hey, Leslie, uh, what is it going to be like to see Levi Wallace on the other side of the field on Sunday? And what did he mean to you guys when, when he was a part of the Bills? Well, you know, he's one of my favorites. I'm sure everybody on defense, one of your favorites. Uh, you know, he's a guy who made a lot of plays for us, Matty. We had a lot of success uh, with him playing for us. And, you know, he's just a great guy and was a tremendous player for us. So it's going to be uh, with mixed emotions to see him wearing another uniform. Uh, I look forward to seeing him and, and getting a chance to say hello uh, and just high-fiving him. Uh, obviously, we want our guys to do well, uh, but I uh, look forward to, to seeing him with a lot of respect for Levi. He was uh, outstanding for us. Thanks, Leslie. You're welcome. Hey, Leslie, the, the fourth down stop, obviously, you know, Poyer got the interception there at the end in the end zone, but the, the three stops before they got down to the one, you know, Matt Milano had, you know, the, the stop on Dobbins. Just how big was Milano's performance in general with, you know, 13 tackles and then just the ability there to hold the Ravens inside, you know, when they were at the goal line? Yeah, Matt had an outstanding game. I mean, he was all over the place. There were a couple of times. It was he and the quarterback, Lamar Jackson, one-on-one. -on -one. He made some great open field tackles. And that play near the goal line really helped to set up the fourth down play because they, they got in their goal line offense and Matt shoots through and, and gets a tackle for loss. They kind of set us up for third down. And that entire sequence, man, just uh, to see our guys just take it one play at a time and just continue to make plays it just speaks to the character of the players and how they persevere and they just believe in, let's play one play at a time, not look back at the previous play, not look ahead to the next play, let's just play this play. And then we come up with the big stop with Jordan getting the interception. Hi, Leslie. Um, hey, hey man. Uh, this is now, I think, uh, three games now where your defense has had real, real solid success against Lamar Jackson. Does your you don't have to say anything specifically, but does your phone blow up after a game like this with other, you know, people from around the league asking, all right, what's the secret sauce? You'll get some calls, Matt. We do get some calls. Uh, some of our coaches get some calls. Uh, there's no secret sauce. That offense is really, really good, and it's so unique, and it's hard to defend. I mean, they came into the game leading the league in scoring. I mean, they – it's a tough offense. It's tough to defend. And Lamar Jackson is a special, special athlete. Uh, tremendous quarterback. Um, so, yeah, to answer your, your question, yes, there, there are some people that will, will want to reach out and talk, talk through things. But we're not giving out anything. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> That's what I figured. Um, you know, along the same lines, I mean, the, your, your system's success with developing, you know, undrafted players has been really, really good over the course of the last six seasons. Prince Amelie comes in yesterday, and obviously this is a guy in his rookie year asking to play, like, you know, real stats. Played 20 yesterday. Uh, going back and watching the game, it looked like he played pretty well outside of just the, you know, the splash play with the tip of the line. What were your impressions of him, and, and how has he been able to do this coming along so quickly for you guys? I think, Matt, a lot of credit has to go to our D-line coach, uh, Eric Washington and Marcus West, our assistant. I mean, they've been spending time with Prince going back to our OTAs, our phase one, phase two. He's been in our system working with him. He gets released 
coming out of training camp and then we pick him up and put him back on the practice squad a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's the type of athlete that really works extremely hard. And then you've got coaches that understand what it takes to develop players. And that goes for our linebackers coach, Bobby Babbage, our secondary coach, uh, John Butler and Jimmy Salgado. Those guys have done a great job here in developing young players, whether they were undrafted or drafted, and which you have to be able to do in our league today. But uh, Prince, uh, his work ethic, along with his physical talent, allowed him to go out and really help us yesterday to, to, to win that ball game. Thanks, Lawson. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Hey, Leslie, John Warrell. Hey, John. Hate to put you on the spot like this and because I know, I know you don't have a say about payroll, but how valuable is Jordan Poyer to this defense? Well, he, he's, he's extremely valuable. And the fact that, you know, we're missing Micah now has kind of, John, raised his value uh, from a leadership standpoint as well as a playmaking standpoint uh, for us as a defense. So we're happy to get him back after missing the Miami game. And hopefully he can stay healthy and be on the field the rest of this season. But uh, he's extremely valuable to our success as a defense. His leadership, his playmaking ability, uh, just his the, the things that rub off on the young players. To have him in there alongside of a young DeMar uh, Hamlin, that safety, uh, was big for our defense yesterday. When, I mean, we all remember Jordan, uh, sorry, Micah's interception against New England last year where he just ran for the ball and, 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 and made that over-the-shoulder catch. Is, is what we saw from Jordan last uh, yesterday in, in, in that interception in the end zone, just is that a similar instinctive thing that veterans, maybe only veterans kind of have? I think there's something to that, John. I mean, that play kind of breaks down as our defensive line is doing a good job of putting pressure on the quarterback. And Jordan realizes there's a receiver in the corner uh, that might have a chance to make a play. And he just instinctively runs to that spot and makes a great play uh, for our defense and for our team. So some of it you can chalk up to experience and great instincts. Thanks, Leslie. You're welcome. Go. Good afternoon, Coach Frazier, George Radney, Challenger Committee News. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well, George. How are you? Good. Doing great. And uh, when was it in the game where you felt that you said, hey, we need you need to turn the heat up a little bit on them and went with those stunts on the defensive line and also the blitzes and, and, and your confidence in DeMar because you, you sent him a lot. He came several times in that second half from all different angles as well. Yeah, you know, as the game went on, George, I mean, that's a really tough offense and you're trying to, you know, get on uh, this right tempo with them because it's one thing to practice. Mm -hmm. That offense, and uh, by the way, Tavon Austin did a, a, a great job for us this week in really trying to simulate and emulate uh, who Lamar is, and, and we were trying to get a good pitching practice. But there's nothing like going out there in the game at game speed and trying to defend that offense. And so we were trying to get in a rhythm, and eventually we, we found a rhythm, and we began to bring some pressures to see if that would help us some, and, and it did. Those pressures definitely helped. Yeah, and, and last but he brought up Tay Tavon Austin. Very good. Uh, I was just thinking that earlier for the head coach, but how, how is it beneficial that they changed the rules on the uh, practice squad and that you could have a more, way more players? That, I think it used to be five players uh, back in, the, I guess, back in the day a few years ago. But how, how is it where you could have that many guys and you could have some veteran guys like a Tavon Austin who may not necessarily made the team back when it was just five uh, practice squad players? Yeah, this is so much better, man, with the way the, the injuries occur today. And it's better for players, too, because you're right. A guy like Tavon years ago would potentially be out of the league right now, be waiting for a job. And now he at least has a chance to be on a roster or participating in practice, albeit you know, not elevated to the uh, 53. Uh, but it really helps your team from a depth standpoint. It helps with your practices. And it employs some guys who might be unemployed. So it's a win-win for every, everyone. That's what I thought. Hey, thank you very much, and good luck this coming Sunday. Thank you. Hey, Leslie. Um, I know you touched on Matt Milano some already, but with some of these tackles for loss he's had, you know, yesterday at the last stretch, um, some of it's reacting, obviously, but what does he do during the week to prepare him to kind of maybe sniff out some of those plays or anything behind the scenes to put him in that best position to make these plays? 
Well, Catherine, uh, he's Matt is really a student of the game. I mean, he spends a lot of time watching tape on his own. Yes, we have our meetings with our players, but Matt, Tremaine, George, some of our veteran players, they'll get together on these Wednesdays and Thursdays and just watch tape alone. They communicate amongst each other about their responsibilities. And I think that's part of why Matt's able to anticipate and make some of the plays that he makes. And uh, that extra time that he spends behind the scenes in preparation, you'll see him in post-practice, staying afterwards, working on catching the ball or working on his drops and, and working on the tackling part of it. So just that extra that he's willing to spend, I think has a lot to do with the results that we see on Sundays. Is there anything that he's changed or added to his weekly preparation that you've seen really help him over the years? I think it's just been a matter of uh, maturing as a player and understanding the importance of taking care of his body. If you remember, uh, and I hope he'll be fine the rest of this year, he, he struggled staying healthy throughout a season. And he's doing a really good job of taking care of his body away from the building, uh, his nutrition, uh, all those little things, along with spending that extra time in film study, uh, meeting with his teammates, uh, communicating, uh, just growing as a player, maturing as a player as he's a game more experienced as an NFL player. Awesome. Thanks. You're welcome. Hey, Leslie, I was curious. I know you talked about how DeMar played, but I was curious more specifically between him and Jaquan, what what traits do each of them have that you kind of you decide as Mike is now going to miss so much time? What do they each do well that kind of makes sense to have DeMar fill that spot yesterday and play so many snaps? Like what specifically stands out about each of them? Uh, in DeMar's case, uh, you know, he's a guy who has the athleticism to uh, sometimes cover tight ends and receivers that are out in space. And he's a really good blitzer, uh, can really kind of quarterback things. It definitely helps to have a Jordan alongside of you uh, to help with that. Uh, but that's the intangible that he has, the coverability. Uh, whereas with Jaquan, you know, he's a physical, hard-nosed, safety, one of our best special teams players. Uh, his strength is his physicality. You know, he's going to be one of those guys who's going to really rock you if you're running back, carrying the football, or tight end trying to make a catch across the middle. Uh, his physicality is probably his strength, and that's probably what separates the two of them. Uh, some of the stuff that DeMar can do out in space versus some of the things that Jaquan can do closer to the line of scrimmage. Definitely. And then I was curious too, like off that, knowing that, you know, Jordan's now back out there, and do you adjust what Jordan's doing at all? It, because Micah's not out there, is Jordan do different things and, you know, DeMar take on some, how much does it change, I guess? Like what you're asking Jordan to do, or is he still kind of doing what he would be if Micah was still out there? He's pretty much, Elena, still doing the things he would ordinarily do if, if Micah were there. It's just the difference is, you know, he probably has to be a little bit more vocal than he would have had to be if Micah were there. Um, may have to be more proactive in communicating, hey, look for this, look for that. Uh, but as far as job responsibility, that part really won't change. It's just his leadership level uh, will change and it has changed because of the absence of Micah. Do you feel DeMar's done enough to kind of have that starting role back there with Micah going forward? Or do you think maybe, do you see Jaquan potentially also being out there? How do you kind of see that shaking out now? Yeah, you got to let it play out. I mean, it's still so early uh, for both guys. And uh, Jaquan could easily be back in there, you know, at any point. Uh, so we'll continue to evaluate it and just see how DeMar does. But uh, Jaquan is going to have his opportunities as well. And we'll just see how it plays out. Thanks. Well. Hey, Leslie. I know there's uncertainty with who might be the starting quarterback for the Steelers for Sunday's game. How much does Mitch's experience with you guys in the Bills a year ago maybe help mitigate some of that uncertainty because you actually had him in the building? And while obviously Josh was the starter, um, you know, you, you were able to see who he is as a quarterback. Yeah, maybe to a degree, John. You know, when we saw him, uh, he was more operating the opponent's offense as opposed to the Bills' offense. He was giving us looks more so on defense. So here he'd be operating the Steelers' offense, and, you know, it's a little bit different. Uh, this is the offense that he knows now. Uh, he's in charge of it. Uh, so it's not quite the same, uh, but there are some similarities. And I know you mentioned when 
Trey was put on pup to start the season, it, it kind of gave you some clarity because you knew for four weeks he's not going to be there. Well, now he's eligible. We now the uncertainty is back. How does that affect things now that once again there you're kind of going day by day with uncertainty in, in terms of his return? I'm sure at some point, uh, Sean and Brandon and Nate Breskey will, our athletic trainer will give me an idea of what the prognosis is uh, as far as his being back on the field and maybe participating in some of the things we're doing. And until then, you know, we just continue to operate uh, the way we have and we'll see how it all plays out. Thanks, Leslie. You're welcome. That's all we have for today. Thanks, Leslie. All right, you're welcome.